very much for the invitation. I am particularly delighted to be speaking to you today and honored to be the first speaker because at the minute we are working on a national strategy which will be published on Monday that would outline how we intend to tackle TB in the UK. At the same time, many of you would be aware that globally the WHO is looking at the post-2015 strategy, which hopefully in the next couple of months with full UK government support will be launched. That again, would outline the vision beyond um, 2015, which is where all our targets are, are, are been. Um, it is therefore timely, I think, to be talking about the global and national picture all in the same context, because indeed TB in the UK is driven by the global epidemic. I'd like to look at the epidemiology and reiterate a few points that have been made uh, already, but emphasize them. So firstly, we know that there are nearly 9 million cases of TB uh, globally, and we know that the, disproportionately the burden of this is in the poorest countries in the world and some middle income countries, with a very large number of cases in India, China, parts of Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. The highest rates of TB, however, are in southern parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, where because of HIV, the absolute rates are much higher than they are anywhere else in the world. We've also heard that TB continues to kill a large number of people. Well over a million people die each year from TB. And many, many of these are people with, uh, co-infected with HIV. Um, among this 1.3 million, the, the 300,000 or more are people with uh, HIV. Fortunately, the global trends are that TB, have been, TB rates have been declining for quite some time now. Unfortunately, the rate of decline is terribly low. Um, we are progressing at rates, in fact, lower than the rate at which TB declined across Western Europe with industrialization and uh, people becoming wealthier. So we know we can do a lot better. The sort of ambitions in the post-2015 targets of the WHO is that we should uh, aim at getting a 10% annual decline in TB. And if we are able to achieve that, then hopefully by 2035, rates in many of these poorer countries will be similar to uh, the rates that we have now in the US and other low incidence countries. Another worrying statistic, uh, which the WHO made the theme of this year's World TB Day, is just the sheer number of people that have TB, but they're actually not been properly diagnosed. A staggering 3 million people are missed by TB services globally. Now, three million individuals that have a disease that um, has considerably high mortality without treatment are not getting access to care or services. I think that that is um, disgraceful and completely unacceptable in a planet where we have the city of London possibly having bonuses that are larger than the TB control budget of um, the whole planet, if we put it together. There is some good news. There are places where things are progressing. For example, this recent Lancet paper um, in, from China suggests that using their prevalence surveys, they've been able to show that with increasing wealth, actually rates of TB in China are coming down. We know the story of Brazil, where again they've made remarkable progress, falling below the 40 per 100,000 threshold we use to screen people in the UK because things have uh, declined. These examples illustrate that where there is the will and where there is investment and money, we can make a difference. Even in places like South Africa, with the success of the HIV community in providing access to antiretrovirals. There was a paper published last year in Science suggesting that in KwaZulu-Natal, in the Africa Center uh, surveillance area, they've managed to turn around uh, the, the incidence of HIV by providing antiretrovirals and red sub have been uh, controlled. Now, I have no doubt that that is having an impact on TB rates, and it's likely that if we look carefully, you would see that with the success in antiretrovirals, TB rates in South Africa have been affected. But perhaps, to finish up with the global picture, one example that um, impressed me in the last year was a talk I had at the UCL Lancet lecture last year, which in which uh, the Minister of Health from Rwanda uh, gave a talk which is titled, uh, Charity Does Not Rhyme with, the, with the Development. And incredibly, she made the case within the hour she spoke that starting with a point where uh, 20 years ago, a sizable population, a proportion of their population uh, died in the genocide. Uh, they've managed to treble life expectancy. They've managed literally to get rid of many of these infectious killers. Just the right focus, right attention, looking at things differently, and the right investments of small amounts of money could make a big, big difference in TB control and infectious diseases in general. So I believe that with the right will, the right people in place, uh, we would be able to control TB. I'll now go to the second part of my talk, and um, 
sort of move closer to home. So this slide shows you the picture in Europe. And as you can see, the highest rates of TB notification rates in, the, uh, in that slide would suggest that we have the highest rates in Europe in the eastern part of Europe. So mostly former um, Central Asian republics, uh, former Soviet republics and Russia. We have intermediate rates in Central Europe and we have the lowest rates in Western Europe. Interestingly, <coughs> Eastern Europe is also the place where we have the biggest problems with drug resistant TB. Today in the UK, if we get a case from the Baltics, about one in three of them would have MDR TB, which would suggest that the background rate over there must be incredibly high. And I'm sure that that's backed up by the global data from those countries as well. If you look interestingly at the epidemiology of cases, most TB in Western Europe is among migrants. And so most individuals with TB in Western European countries are people born elsewhere. Whereas in Eastern Europe, it's actually in people born in those places. In the UK, as has already been alluded to, for about two decades now, since 1987, we've had a year-on-year -year increase in TB rates and in TB numbers. Today, we have a rate of um, about 14 to 15 per 100,000 um, and about 9,000 cases annually. We've reached a level where, as shown by this um, paper we published last year in The Lancet, that if we don't act and if we don't do something about it, in a couple of years we'll have more cases of TB in the UK than in the whole of the United States. Again, that's completely unacceptable because TB is treatable, TB is preventable. This map shows the distribution of TB cases in the UK. And as you can see, if you live in rural Devon or in some of the leafy parts of the southeast, your chances of encountering the case of TB, say as a GP, is tiny. Um, there are just very few cases. By contrast, if you live in some boroughs of London, such as New York Tower, Hamlets, etc., and Brett, you would have more cases than you have in Karonga district in Malawi. Huge disparities. The good thing about this is it allows for targeted action. If we know that the TB problem is located in particular areas, then you could also target your investments to deal with it. But it also says something about our responsibility and duty to tackle TB overseas because clearly many of these individuals are acquiring TB from elsewhere. This is a breakdown of the TB rates and numbers by place of birth. And as you can see, most of the increase actually can be attributed to non-UK born individuals. So the top line um, shows the rates in non-UK born individuals and the brown bars shows the numbers of cases. Rates in the UK born have remained rem remarkably stable. Um, you'd expect that if this is mostly TB in elderly individuals that acquired TB a long time ago when TB was common in the UK, it should be declining. And there are two good reasons why it isn't. One that Alistair will probably come back to in a great deal of detail, which is the hard to reach individuals, the homeless individuals, prisoners who are acquiring TB today in the UK, and the other uh, children of migrants. So the communities where people are acquiring TB from their parents or traveling to the countries where their parents came from. The other interesting facet of TB in the non-UK born is the fact that a sizable proportion of them may develop TB shortly after arrival, but actually if we total up this graph from about two years onwards, the vast majority of people develop TB many years after arrival. So any program that just takes an x-ray at Gatwick or Heathrow would not find TB in those individuals. They are probably latently infected, but they don't have active TB. So we must tackle TB in communities within the UK and not through chest x-rays at airports. By contrast, however, the fact that a sizable proportion may be infected probably opens up the option to begin to explore strategies tackling latent TB infection after people have settled. This shows a breakdown uh, of rates and numbers by country of origin. And as you can see, um, if you total up the top five, six countries, actually you have something over half of the foreign-born cases. So in fact, you can be even more intelligent about how you screen people by focusing on the countries with the highest rates and the highest numbers of TB. This graph illustrates a point that I made earlier, which is if you look at children of ethnic minority households, as are Black, African, Indian, Pakistan, or Bangladeshi, the rates of TB is something like tenfold more than in white UK-born individuals, suggesting very high rates in those communities. The rates in non-UK-born populations are indeed comparable to many parts of the developing world, being well over 100 in most of those communities. The other key risk group, which again I've alluded to earlier, are the individuals we describe as hard to reach. These groups are important not just because they cause a sizable number of cases, they do cause a sizable number, but because this is where if we get it wrong, we would have the big outbreaks they had in New York, we would have the problems of drug resistance, we would have people that are lost to follow up and infecting others, 
And we know using DNA fingerprinting that homelessness is an independent risk factor for TB transmission in the UK. HIV is the reason why TB increased largely in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we have had al almost uh, at the same time as the increase in migration from Sub-Saharan Africa an increase in TB rates in those communities. Um, but current data suggests that about 4% of TB cases have TB HIV co-infection. This is data on our MDR TB trends in the UK. And as you can see, we've had an increase in INH resistant TB, a large part of that driven by an outbreak in London, in which we now have over 400 cases, possibly the largest outbreak of INH resistant TB in Europe. Since we started monitoring in about 1995, we have had a total of 26 HDR cases, but our MDR rates have also increased from about 1% to about 2%. But this hides a particular problem, which is that that 1% is of a smaller number of cases, and it was about 30 cases a year and the numbers have almost trebled in that period. So we have about 80 cases a year now. And if you know how difficult MDR TB is to manage, this is a sizable challenge. What about treatment outcome? We are not doing that badly. Um, about 82% of TB cases complete treatment in the UK. But very, very embarrassingly, about one in 20 are lost to follow up. A wealthy country such as the UK should not have one in 20 people lost to follow up. I accept that some of these are people that leave the country but there are people being treated in the UK that are lost to put for loss. And this is not to say that healthcare workers are not doing enough, but the system, our social systems and society in general, is failing if we are not getting these individuals treated. In MDR TB, again, we are doing remarkably well. 72% of people completed treatment, and in the last year for which we have data, actually no one died in the cohort, the 2010 cohort. So remarkably good service in terms of if you are diagnosed and if you are treated. But this is a very complex problem, and. I, I think we can still do better than that. I'd like to finish uh, by summarizing what we are doing at the moment. So historically, um, the Chief Medical Officer in 2004 published an action plan for England which outlined what we would do to control TB. Interestingly, if we open the second page of that plan, it says action required, colon, no action. Surprise, surprise, <laughs> nothing happened. <laughs> we have lots of evidence, we have lots of guidelines. and. Between 2006 and 2011, there were uh, guidelines published by NICE, some of the best in the world. We know what to do. They are clearly outlined there. And we are currently um, co-chair of the NICE Guideline Development Group with Alan and colleagues uh, looking at revising those guidelines. In 2003, Public Health England formally recognized that TB is a challenge and a priority and set up a process which is culminating next week in the publication of a national strategy. And we hope that that will be promptly implemented in the next year or two. Thank you very much for listening.